All right. Spatial Shark Pack with you again for our last unit, Unit 7, uh, before we take the AP Human Geography exam. Remember, of course, that the David Palmer Blue Book is a little bit out of order. So when you're reading the David Palmer Blue Book, it's Unit 6 is industry and Unit 7 is urban. And of course, the College Board reconfigured it and they have urban as Unit 6 and industry as Unit 7. So a little bit of a switcheroo. Uh, but I think you guys are probably bright and talented enough to figure out what's going on. But this is Unit 7 in the CED, uh, and this is all about industry and economic development. Uh, here is a steel factory in China, for example. So obviously a lot about industry. Um, we're going to talk about first the historical aspect of the Industrial Revolution. And that's obviously important because, you know, we, we have to start there. We have to start at some point. But uh, industry has actually been around uh, since, you know, mankind started to fashion tools and started to build things and make things. Uh, it's just that when we say the Industrial Revolution, we talk about the change of how we were doing these kinds of tasks. Um, cottage industries, you know, the old guilds where you had the craftsmen and the journeyman and the apprentice, and they would make a pair of shoes and all that. And they might make one pair of shoes a week. Uh, but now, of course, we mass produce everything because it's all about economies of scale now. Tremendous amounts of raw materials, tremendous amounts of machinery, huge amounts of labor and just amazing amounts of products that you and I buy and that we consume. So when we think about the Industrial Revolution, our time frame, really, we think about the UK in the early 1700s. And certainly the United Kingdom had these comparative advantages. They had land, they had labor, they had capital, they had a laissez-faire economic system where the British government allowed capitalists, the people who had money, the people who could buy machinery, the people who, who could build factories, uh, you know, it stimulated the growth of their industries. And of course, the British didn't want that secret to get out, but there were people who immigrated with an E uh, for example, came to the United States and brought that know-how with them and started to build industries in the United States as well. So historically, this Industrial Revolution is a good place for us to kind of think about how industry really developed. And certainly there are countries in the world today who are still going through this uh, innovation of industry. Uh, those are newly emerging economies as opposed to the old economies uh, where the Industrial Revolution happened hundreds of years ago. And we have to know some of the big effects. Uh, what happened because of the Industrial Revolution? We know that there's a shift from rural to urban. We know that as machines replace people on the farms, uh, food yields increased. And with more food, there's always more people. Social class is developed. Um, you know, we start to see life expectancies increase. The global population goes from less than a billion at the time to now almost 8 billion people. Uh, and all of these things are due to this industrial revolution, which coincides with our second agricultural revolution, which you remember, of course, when we went back into uh, that unit, unit uh, five, right, with agriculture, just before we talked about cities. So there's a lot going on here in this slide, of course. Now, one of the big things to remember also is that we can uh, compartmentalize economic activity into these sectors. Right. We talked about primary is anything extractive, farming, fishing, forestry, mining. Uh, we talked about this in unit five. Um, and then we talked about secondary. You have to take the raw material and then you process it. Right? Manufacturing, factories, any kind of, um, you know, work that's going to take an item and change it or manufacture it into something more useful with higher value added usually. But one thing that has also happened is the growth of services which we call those tertiary jobs. And these are going to be closely linked really with where people live, right? Because obviously you need customers to provide a service to, right? And we've now said that tertiary has gotten so specific that we now have kinds of tertiary that they'll label as either quaternary or quinary. Now quaternary, I always tell kids to remember a quarter, you have four quarters and a dollar. Think about the, the letters F-I-R-E, finance, insurance, real estate. Those are the big areas of quaternary activity. Anytime you're information processing, anytime you're dealing with information, that's a quaternary activity. And we say that that's footloose. 
not Kevin Bacon, not dancing at church, right? What we're talking about is footloose, meaning there's no location where a quaternary activity has to be. It could be anywhere because it really just depends on uh, communication, accessibility, right? Your money manager could be anywhere in the world, right? They don't have to be a place that you can physically get to because you're doing everything by phone, by fax, by you know email, by video conference. Look at, look at the Zoom economy of today how many people are basically just, you know, interacting electronically rather than face to face. All right. And so we just talked about the flexibility and the idea of the footloose activities. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, back offices, you know, the, the company headquarters might be in a tall building in a big city. But sometimes when you send your payment to the bank, it goes to somewhere in South Dakota because, you know, the location's cheap, the labor's cheap, and, and, and all they have to do is have access to a keyboard and everything is pretty seamless for them anyway. And then you talk about quinary activities. This is always leadership or decision making. Could be politicians, could be in the government, could be executive level type jobs, uh, could be people that are, you know, again, making big, big decisions for others, right? So you can see that there's kind of this hierarchical system, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quinary of the different types of jobs that people do. But all of these things are, of course, related to each other. You could talk about the CEO of McDonald's. You could talk about the accountants that are controlling the finances of McDonald's, right? And the stocks and, and the investments. You could talk about uh, the people at McDonald's who are serving you your food. You could talk about the people who take the raw materials, the potatoes, the ground beef, the eggs, and they fashion them into the different parts that are going to be shipped frozen to the restaurant and they're going to be prepared for us. And then you could go back to the potato grower out there in Idaho that's growing the russet potato that everybody knows is world famous for McDonald's French fries. So this is just a quick uh, thing here. You can pause. You can take a look at this. You don't need me to explain to you that we've got the tertiary, the quaternary, the quinary here. So I'll give you a second to take a look at that. All right. Now, once we've learned about these sectors of the economy, we need to understand that in today's global economy, services have become a big part of especially the richer countries of the world. You can look, more than 70% of the U.S. economy is now service-based. Uh, this is important because you look at the poorer countries and you see that they don't have very many services, right? They're still going to be locked into those primary and or secondary levels of the economy. More on that later in this slideshow when we start talking about development and how can we indicate development. One way we can do that is say, well, what do people do in that economy, right? If it's a high service economy, it's probably a pretty wealthy country. So we know all about patterns and processes. I mean, we've been doing this since the first day of the school year when I was telling you that basically the only two questions we ask you guys in this class is where and why there. And then, of course, you know, we think about, well, why should we care? Right. So when we think about locational patterns and processes, those questions really become important. Now, we've had some models that we've talked about in the last couple of months. First of all, von Tunen's rings. And we said that, you know, those primary activities, you know, intensive and extensive based on bid rent, based on the perishability. The reality is primary activities pretty much have to be located near the resources. If you're farming, you need soil, you need water. If you're mining, you need to be near the coal. If you are fishing, you better be where the fish are or else you're not going to be successful. Well, secondary activities are going to have to be located somewhere between the resource and the market, right? Now, they could be closer to the resource, they could be closer to the market, or they could be anywhere in between. We already know that tertiary activities have to be near the people unless it's going to be quaternary or quinary, which can be distantiated, right? But generally speaking, when we think about resources and markets for manufacturing, right, we have to make a decision. Where do we want to put the factory? Closer to the raw materials or closer to the people who are going to buy the product? Well, here's where this really becomes the basis of our next big model, right? We're going to look at the cost of the transportation. We're going to look at the cost of the labor. We're going to look at some agglomeration or clustering that sometimes happens as well. So like Von Tunen did with bid rent, like all of the urban models do with bid rent and the cost of the land itself, right? 
What we're going to look at now is we're going to look at the location of the raw materials and we're going to look at the marketplace, right? Where are we going to sell the product? And in order to do this, you know, if it's a model, we have to make assumptions. So what were all of those assumptions that we've been doing all year long? Well, we've said flat isotropic surface. We've said that there's equal purchasing power, that there's no political interruptions, you know, that there's a single market, that raw materials are available, that they're equal. We said the soil quality was the same for Von Tunen. We said that the, you know, the city was on a flat isotropic surface for all of our urban models. We know that these assumptions are not true. We know that one of the big criticisms of a model, and if you ever get this question on the test, you should say that the model is never going to really accurately portray reality because we can't get all of these assumptions in reality. So all models are limited in their usefulness to some degree because they're hypothetical, right? They're not intended to show us every possible, uh, you know, exceptionality or, you know, some special condition, right? Generally speaking, and this is what we have to remember about our class. It's a lot of generalizations, right? So we know that labor and raw materials can be fairly ubiquitous. Uh, people move around the world, right? Uh, there's more than one place that you can find raw materials. Now, some raw materials are very special, and sometimes they can only be found in certain spaces, and that's why they're more special, and that's why they cost more. You know, vanilla, for example, you know, that's Madagascar. They lead the world in vanilla production. So sometimes there are certain things you can only find in certain places, but generally speaking, labor and raw materials are going to be somewhat ubiquitous, meaning that they're available everywhere. And we also know that in today's modern world, that automation is really starting to replace labor in a lot of ways, right? We're having robots that are doing, you know, for example, in car manufacturing, you don't see a lot of people in the factory anymore. So what does any manufacturer want to do? They want to maximize their comparative advantages. If they have a certain technology, if they have a certain idea, if they have a new innovation, a new way of doing something, they're going to exploit that and they're going to compete. Nobody goes into business and says, gee, I hope we suck at this and I hope we go out of business and everybody loses their job. Right? They all want to be successful. They all want to minimize costs. They want to maximize profits. And they want to do a good job. Now, some costs are variable and some costs are fixed. Right? Variable costs will include things like transportation. Right? We even have uh, an equation for this. Transportation is going to be uh, a function of the weight of the product, how far is it going to go, right? And that's going to equate to your cost. The farther something has to move, it's going to cost you more. If it's bigger and bulkier, it might cost more money than something that's small and light. This is why pillows always get packaged in like vacuum packed containers so they can stack more pillows in the box. More pillows per box means less cost overall, right? It's AP common sense. Well, Friction of distance then. Now be careful. This is not the same as distance decay that we talked about way back at the beginning of the year where, oh, something that's happening over there on the other side of the world, I don't know much about it because I'm not there. That's distance decay, the impact of culture, the impact of those things. Here we're talking the friction of distance. I'd rather sell something to the person right next to me than to sell something across the world far, far away where it's going to cost more to ship it than it is to something that's close by, right? Remember that in business, time equals money. That's super important. Now, again, we talked about distance decay just a second. Remember, these two terms are not interchangeable. They're not the same thing. Okay, so we get our model, right? His name is Alfred Weber, and he talks about the uh, industrial location. Uh, it's called the least cost theory. Remember that Von Tunen created the framework for agriculture. We know that we talked about um, Chris Dollar's central place theory, right? And I should have edited this because this is probably a slideshow on this slide where urban used to be unit seven. We've already done urban in unit six. Now we're in unit seven. But we did central place theory. We talked about range. We talked about threshold. We talked about low order and high order services. You guys worked with Houston and you saw coffee shops and fast food and department stores and, and home improvement stores, right? So you know this. Weber's issue is different than those, though, because those deal in generalized locations and Weber deals in specificity. 
he's going to find the absolute cheapest location based on three factors, the cost of the transportation, the cost of the labor, and some agglomeration effects. Now, fun fact, whenever you see the word agglomeration, there will always be 100% of the time, it's like it's married to the word clustering. So if you see clustering in the question, start looking for the word agglomeration in the answers. If you see the word agglomeration in the prompt, start looking for clustering in the answers. Now, of course, item writers might, like me might create some parallelisms in the answers where we might have the word clustering two or three times, and then you're going to have to work a little bit harder. But that's one thing you should always remember. The biggest bang for your buck in this class, guys, is you got to know the vocab. If you know the vocab, you're on your way. If you don't know that Quizlet, if you really haven't read that David Palmer Blue book, it's going to be hard. Hey, we've still got time before you take your AP exam. Even if you've done nothing, which I hope you haven't done nothing, but even if you've done nothing, you still have an amazing chance to get a great score. Now, can politicians manipulate these things like transportation costs? Well, think about tariffs and taxes, right? When things are imported and exported. Right. Think about toll roads and things like that, making it more expensive or less expensive to ship something. Right. Think about labor costs, things like minimum wage, things about things about unions, right, which affect the cost of the labor. Uh, can the politicians affect agglomeration or clustering? Think about zoning laws. Think about the policies that politicians sometimes can manipulate. So it's important that we remember economic, social, cultural, political, right, as well as environmental. Think about all of these aspects as we talk about this. Okay, now, no judgment here, but we're going to talk about the importance of weight, okay? You know, 215, 220, perhaps, <laughs> slightly overweight. But when we think about the importance of weight, we're talking about the product that we're trying to move. It has to be transferable, right? It has to be something that at least, you know, we can move it, right? It, it's not so uh, difficult or costly that it doesn't make sense, right? That's why we generally don't ship coal far, far, far away, because we'd rather just find it closer to the source of, you know, the source of it where we're going to need to process it, right? Now, we can certainly put coal on trains and we could put it on ships and big things like that. But remember that, you know, back in the day, we didn't have the same transportation that we have nowadays. Nowadays, we have uh, modes of transportation that can get things across the world uh, in a much quicker amount of time. But transferability is always a big part of transportation. Now, if it's going to go short distances, we generally put it on a truck. There's a couple of reasons why it goes on a truck. First, the trucks are very flexible. They can go on a lot of different roadways as long as they don't have any of those low bridges. The only problem with the truck is it can only go about 65 miles an hour. Uh, it has to stop at traffic signals and things like that. The driver has to sleep right? Because federal law requires that the driver can't go more than eight hours, right? So if it's going to go more than about a couple hundred miles, we generally don't want to put it on a truck. We'll put it on a train. The train doesn't have to stop, stop for trucks, right? The train just keeps going and the train can go faster and it can carry more like a truck. It's one container. It's one box, maybe two. If you see those big long trucks on the highway that are doubled up, right? But generally it's one 53 foot long box. Well, then go over to you know Federal Highway and watch the train that goes by at nighttime, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those containers. Well, then you think about the ships. There's thousands and thousands of containers on those ships nowadays. Those ships are as big as the Empire State Building is tall, right? So they can carry tens of thousands of containers, which represents tens of thousands of trucks, right? So it's all about economies of scale. Line costs. The farther it goes, the more it costs. Terminal costs, where does it stop and start? Is it a port? Is it an airport? Is it a, is it a, is it a warehouse or a distribution center? And route flexibility. You know, the ship has to stay in the water, right? You know, the train can only go on the tracks, right? The truck has to, the truck has a lot of flexibility because there's a lot of different roadways. The train doesn't have as much flexibility and the ship doesn't have nearly as much flexibility. And kids will sometimes say, what about airplanes? Yeah, the problem is airplanes are almost always too expensive and they can't carry enough. So generally, the only thing we're going to put on planes are things that are super perishable. Uh, something like cut flowers, that's going to get flown, right? So the location of your distribution centers has to be carefully chosen. We have to think about, is the product getting bigger and heavier or is the product getting smaller and lighter? If it's bulk gaining, meaning we take a lot of little raw materials and we build something bigger, like a car, 
right? A lot of auto parts make a car. That's bulk gaining. We want to do that as close as possible to the consumer. This is why Japanese car companies and Korean and German and a lot of others, they're building cars in America now because we buy 80% of all the new cars in the world anyway. Why would I build the Honda in Japan and then send it to America? That costs money. Why don't I just build it in the United States? And, and this is a fun thing we may do in class. I may have you guys do a little homework assignment or I'm going to ask you to walk out to your car and I'm going to ask you to open the driver door and look for the sticker inside that says, where was your car made? Generally speaking, even though it may be a BMW, right? If it's a BMW SUV, it was made in South Carolina, right? Uh, so many vehicles nowadays are going to be made close to the market where they're going to be bought and sold. Now, bulk reducing, that's a little bit different. You take something big and heavy, and as you process it, it gets smaller and lighter. And this is like steel manufacturing, right? Because the iron ore is big and heavy, and the coal is big and heavy. But when you take that iron ore and you heat it up really super hot and you and you achieve that red hot liquefaction and you and you really process it and press it and consolidate it into steel, the steel is going to be lighter and easier to ship than the iron ore and the coal that are used to make that process. So you'd rather have the steel manufacturing being done close to the raw material because you don't want to move the raw materials. You'd rather move the finished product. Right. So you have to think bulk gaining versus bulk reducing. And it's not just weight, it is bulk, right? Because sometimes things can be not necessarily heavier, but certainly bulkier, right? For example, Coca-Cola, it gets shipped around the world as a syrup, right? It's manufactured as a syrup. And then it goes around the world and then they add the carbonated water and then they put it into a glass bottle or whatever. If it's the old, you know, kind of Coke that's in the glass bottle. Nowadays, so much of it is plastic or they put it in cans, whatever. But generally speaking, Coke is going to get shipped as a syrup, not shipped as the actual liquid itself. Because once you add the water, the weight goes up tremendously. This is why rice is usually used as food aid around the world, because you can ship tons of rice. It doesn't really get big and bulky and heavy until you add the water. All right. So I just talked about a couple of things there. You can see Coke. You can see steel cars. I'll let you figure out potato chips and paper. If you have questions, you can certainly come and talk to me. Potato chips, though, that's an interesting one. Be careful. Yes, you do slice the potato and it gets lighter. But remember, everybody hates broken chips, which is why your bag of potato chips is generally about 30% air. And you know what? It costs a lot of money to ship air. And that's kind of, you know, a waste of money, really. But that's why potato chips, they're not really bulk reducing. They're actually kind of bulk gaining because they have to have a lot of air in the bag. Now, we could also talk about bulk gaining, bulk reducing in terms of what we call market orientation or material orientation. If something is bulk gaining, meaning it's going to get bigger and heavier, we say that's market oriented because we're going to we're going to make it near the market. If it's bulk reducing, we say it's materially oriented because we want it to be closer to the raw materials, right? So think about images of those things in your head. Nowadays, of course, we have big container ships, and I talked about those just a second. And of course, if you've had any kind of contact with the news lately, you know that containerized shipping is in the news. Uh, and this has replaced the old break of bulk, right? So if you watch any of the AP Daily videos, you know Spatial Shark is back for Unit 7. And there's a really cool animation in one of the videos that I did for Break of Bulk. So you might want to check that one out. But Break of Bulk is the old way where people used to get on and off the ship and they would, by hand, unload and load and unload and load and unload and load. And that takes time. Remember what I told you? Time is money when it comes to business. So now we have these entrepots, these import export places like Singapore, Hong Kong, the port of Long Beach in Los Angeles, Port Everglades near Fort Lauderdale, right? Uh, Charleston, South Carolina is now going to be the biggest, deepest water port on the entire East coast of the United States. Lots of things come in and out of these places. And sometimes they have what they call break of bulk, where they're going to take the container off the ship, put it on a truck or put it on a train and continue it on its way. Okay. Now, Here's what Weber looks like. Now, we said Kristaller is always hexagons, and we know that Von Thunen is rings. And, 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 you know, you have to be able sometimes to close your eyes and you have to see the models because what word could they possibly use on the test? They could say, describe the model. 
What does it look like? How does it function? Right. Um, of course, we got the market M. We have the raw materials, which are labeled here as S1 and S2. We're assuming a very simplistic example here where there's only two raw materials. This might be something like steel where you've got iron ore and coal. OK, in this case, the site of the factory would want to be closer to the site of the raw materials because it's a bulk reducing activity. Right. If it was something bulk gaining that's going to get high, uh, heavier, like coke, which is the syrup, and then you add the water, then that site of the factory is going to get shifted closer to the market because I don't want to move the water. Right. Why would I move water? Water is ubiquitous. I can get water anywhere. So that site of the factory would shift. And so what happens with these triangles is that the locations of the market and the raw materials are somewhat fixed but then the location of the factory can sometimes move around as these costs are variable, okay? So this, for example, is Anheuser-Busch and, and, and Miller Coors, right? Big beer makers in the United States. Now, again, you don't really wanna move beer already made. You'd rather make beer close to the people who are gonna drink it. That's why you don't see any beer factories out where there are no people. Where you see the concentrations of population, the more red colors, what do you notice? Look where all the circles are. They're right on top of the people. You'd rather make the beer close to the people. That's a bulk gaining activity. Okay. Um, if it was something like corn to make ethanol, right? And, and we put ethanol into fuel now, like 10% of the gas you're pumping in your car is made by ethanol, right? Well, we don't want to move the corn. The corn is big and heavy. It takes millions of bushels of corn to make gallons of ethanol, right? So you're going to notice that the ethanol plants are all right on top of the, the corn growing in Iowa, you know, those states that start with I, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, big corn producing states. Now, here's another example. This one is copper mining. And some of the biggest copper deposits are in the southwestern United States, the desert southwest, particularly in Arizona. And yet you see that there's copper foundries in places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois. And so they have to ship the copper there, but they don't want to ship the raw ore. They want to take that ore out of the ground. They want to immediately smelt it, right? And I always think about smelting. Just take away the S. <laughs> they're melting the copper down and they're making it lighter and easier to transport. And then they're going to move it to California, to Illinois, to Ohio, to Pennsylvania, right? So that they can actually manufacture stuff out of it. Copper, of course, is used a lot because it's a conductor, right? So they use it in wiring and they use it in all kinds of things like that. Now, this is basically just an illustration of what I was talking about. The top one is going to be material oriented, right? The factory is going to be close to the raw materials because that is a bulk reducing. Take six trucks of raw material to make one truck of the finished product. And then I'd rather move one truck, pay one driver, right? Pay one toll on the highway rather than all those other trucks. Now, the middle one is a bulk gaining activity. Only two trucks of raw materials to make four trucks of the finished product. I rather move two trucks than four, so I'm going to move my factory all the way close to the market. The one on the bottom, that's your intermodal break of bulk where you take it off of a ship and put it on a truck or put it on a train or whatever the case may be. So when, when I talk about containerized shipping, this is what I'm talking about. These big vessels that you sometimes see if you go in and out of a port, and I know we're in a COVID world, we haven't cruised as much as we might like, but we can see these big boxes stacked. Look at all the trucks there. Some are full, some are empty. All of those boxes on that ship are the size, 53 feet long, of the boxes that are behind a truck on the highway or stacked onto a train, sometimes too high, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of train cars. So these container ships have changed. They've revolutionized everything about the global economy because it's easy now to move something across the world in, in a fairly short amount of time, right? So for example, um, most of the cargo ships, they go back and forth between Asia and Europe. And of course, some come to the United States across the Pacific or across the Atlantic, but this is just highlighting you know, the Eurasian market there, the trade between China, for example, and the EU, which is growing a lot. And you can see that they go to places like Korea and they go to Shanghai, they go to Hong Kong, they go to Singapore. You look at the dots, right? Port Suez and Port Said, that's on the, you know, Suez Canal that cuts through Egypt to connect the Mediterranean and the Red Sea so that you don't have to go all the way around Africa. 
And then they go up into Europe and they go to places like Rotterdam, which is the biggest port in, in Europe. That's usually a 25 day trip. Okay. So you can make that trip one way per month. So it goes over in one month, it comes back the next month, goes back the next month. And, and they don't ever want it to be empty. They want the containers to always be full, right? Because that's useful. And by the way, right now there's a shortage of empty containers, right? Because, you know, so much of the global economy is now shipping. 70% of global trade is, is by ship like this. 10% of that global trade goes through the Suez Canal. And of course, what have we seen happening, right? We got this one ship. It, it, again, it's as tall as the Empire State Building. It, it, the canal is only wide enough for one ship at a time to go through. They lost power. There was a gust of wind and a sandstorm. And, oh, you know, they crash into the side of the canal. And it's been days, and they think it could be weeks before they get this thing to float again. Meanwhile, hundreds of ships are being backed up right? It's costing billions of dollars per day. They estimated it's $400 million an hour that the global economy is losing because this ship is stuck in the middle of the canal, okay? It's really critically important. This is why geography matters, right? Now, we've also got a Panama Canal. We've got a lot of these choke points. Some of them are man-made, some of them are natural. The Strait of Malacca by Singapore, it is very, very slow going for ships because it's narrow and the water is shallow. The Strait of Hormuz coming out of the Persian Gulf, where 25% of the world's oil supply comes out. A lot of oil goes through the Suez Canal on big tanker ships. We might be paying more for gas as a result of this. You're certainly probably going to see some delays and some hiccups in the logistics of shipping and transportation. All right. In addition to transportation, we've got the labor costs, right? Obviously, the employers, they want a well-educated workforce, but, you know, they don't want them to be too smart because smart people start asking for more money. So they want them to be, you know, skilled, but not too educated, right? Uh, they want them to be uh, proficient, right? They want them to be productive. They, don't, they want them to be able to do a lot in a little amount of time. Now, post-World War II, we saw that Japan became one of the biggest centers of manufacturing in the world. Uh, after the war, they rebuilt their economy with help from the United States. Uh, Japan became an innovator in a lot of new kinds of uh, manufacturing technologies and strategies. And as a result, they started to undercut the American and the European industries that had been big since the Industrial Revolution. Japan's your first real non-European country that goes through that Industrial Revolution. It really starts for the AP World History kids uh, with the Meiji Restoration of the 1860s, when the Japanese monarchy embraced modernization and, and uh, international uh, trade. I remember Japan for a long time was closed off and didn't want to part participate in, in a global sense. Right? So a lot of things in the 50s were made in Japan. Well, Japan hit some hard times economically uh, a couple of decades ago. And as a result, there became known uh, these tiger economies, right? And the tiger economies were Hong Kong, which at that time was British owned. Remember, the British had to give Hong Kong back in 1997. Today, there's a lot of problems politically between China and Hong Kong because China wants Hong Kong to become part of the Chinese government again. Remember, it had, it had been British for 99 years. China promised that they wouldn't make political changes for 50 years, right? Here we are, 07, 17, 23, four years later, they're starting to get impatient, right? And they're saying, well, we don't want Hong Kong to be free. We don't want freedom of speech. We don't want them to have, uh, you know, a Western type uh, government and society. We want them to be more Chinese, state controlled, right? Authoritarian, where the Communist Party makes all decisions. Uh, South Korea is one of your tigers after the Korean War, which the United States fought for South Korea against the communist North Koreans and also against China in, in that sense as well. Taiwan, another big issue geopolitically with China, because China thinks that Taiwan is a breakaway province of the People's Republic of China. Uh, you know, uh, Taiwan is in that weird situation where they can't really declare independence because if they do, the Chinese have said that they're going to militarily uh, deny Taiwan their independence. But at the same time, they pretty much function as a quasi-independent, somewhat autonomous state. And then, of course, we've got Singapore. 
Singapore, the little tiny city state that's at the very tip of the Malay Peninsula. They used to be part of Malaysia. They broke away in the 1960s and created their own state. Today, it's one of the wealthiest places in the world. And it's also a little uh, really fun. As you guys have heard me talk about uh, the books and the movies about crazy rich Asians, and it's totally true. When you go to Singapore, it is absolutely phenomenal. Well, those Asian economies were huge in the 80s and 90s, but now you look at South Korea and you look at how rich they've become. I mean, they're all Gangnam style. You guys know that from elementary school. South Korea and Singapore and Taiwan, they no longer represent low cost labor. They're making as much money as Americans and Europeans are. So what have manufacturers done? They're constantly seeking comparative advantage. If I can get the job done in, you know, uh, Indonesia or Turkey or South Africa or Brazil, rather than in Japan or in, in, you know, in even China now is almost too expensive in many places. Uh, in many examples, right? The Chinese workers are making too much, right? I could hire workers in a much less developed economy, pay them less and still get the same amount of productivity. All we have to do is shift our manufacturing chains, right? We just have to change the logistics, make the ship go somewhere else, go to a different port, right? Get the raw materials from somewhere else, hire a different worker, right? Use a different country that maybe politically they're giving you a great deal to do your, your factory because they want you to come hire people. That's going to create jobs. That's going to stimulate their economic growth. And as I just said, sometimes even today, China is not, you don't see as many things made in China as you used to. I mean, there was a time 15, 20 years ago, everything was made in China. Now you're starting to see things like Vietnam, you're starting to see, you know, we, 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 if we had everybody in school, I used to love to do this thing called where are you wearing, where we would have kids look at the tags in their clothes. And this was always hard because we had to keep the gifted freshman boys from taking off their shirts in class. Uh, but where are your shoes made? I mentioned earlier, I may ask you to go look at where your car was made. You know, just do the, it's called, sometimes they have what they call a global closet calculator. Just take everything out of your closet. Take everything in your room, right? Turn it upside down. Look at the back of it. Where was it made? Where was your laptop made, right? All the stuff that you have in your room, right? Figure it out. Where did it come from? How much did it cost? How much did it cost to move it from the location it was made to where you are? Nowadays, with the containerized shipping, you know, the cost is really pretty cheap. Labor costs, of course, that's something we still have to figure out. Look at the costs of the European countries over there on the blue side, right? USA is right, kind of right there in the middle. This is average uh, income, average hourly rate of pay. Remember, a lot of people politically in the United States are saying, let's make it $15 minimum wage, right? Federal minimum wage is still like $7.25, right? And then go down to like Indonesia, where they're making less than a dollar an hour. Now, still, that's way more money than the people who are living on less than a dollar a day. Remember our global extreme poverty people, right? Like the slum dwellers we learned about in unit six. Well, a dollar an hour is way more than a dollar a day, right? But even still, look at some of those incomes down there. And is it any wonder why a manufacturer would say, huh, instead of paying somebody $5 or $10 or $15, why wouldn't I go, go somewhere else and pay somebody a lot less? And this is what's happening with this idea of the global economy, right? So it's what we call locational interdependence. And nowadays we see a lot of clustering where one factory will open somewhere and then other competitors start going to the same location. And what they do is they share their costs. They share the cost for creating the power grid. They share the cost for the water pipes. They share the cost for the port facilities. They share the costs for, you know, educating the labor force. They might all contribute to technical colleges or schools to educate the people that are going to ultimately be their employers or their employees. Uh, sometimes they, they poach their employer, their competitor's employees. Hey, these guys work really well for my competitor. Let me see if I can pay them a little bit more and maybe they'll come work for me instead. So it's all about these comparative advantages. We're going to talk about just-in-time delivery uh, a couple times here in the slideshow. It's not like the old way where we would mass produce, you know, extras of everything. 
<coughs> excuse me, and then just have it sitting around. Anytime you have a product sitting around, that, that's just a waste, right? You're, you remember, time is money. I don't want to have a lot of excess product. As soon as it's built, I want it to be sold, right? As soon as the customer picks up the item, I want the replacement item to be arriving in the back of the store. I want, I want it to be a constant just-in-time process. That way I don't have to pay extra for all the inventory, right? Toyota, by the way, the biggest innovator in that just-in-time uh, idea uh, of that system. All right. So the old Fortis system being replaced by flexible production. We now see that parts suppliers are oftentimes locating across the street <laughs> from the manufacturer. That way they can deliver those parts just in time. Uh, if you want to Google search something, it's kind of fun. Google search Toyota and 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 their, their production system. And there are all kinds of videos on YouTube where they take you inside a Toyota factory and they're building, let's say, a Camry, right? And, and the person who installs the seats in the Camry, right? They, they, they take a seat and they have like a machine that helps them. It's like a robotic arm. And, and they're putting the seat in. And while they're doing that activity, behind them, the next seat for the next car is arriving just in time for them to be able to put it in the next car. They don't have 5,000 seats laying around, right? That was the old way. And one of the reasons why Japan had to innovate like this is because, remember, Japan is physically the size of California, right? And yet it's one of the biggest global economies, but it doesn't have a lot of physical size. So they didn't have room to have these massive factories with tons of extra parts. They had to be efficient, right? And, and this is true of a lot of Asian manufacturing. It's highly efficient and skilled, which is why it's usually expensive. But this is why Lexus and Infiniti and Acura and all those car companies, they make the world's most precise equipment, right? The Germans are pretty good at that kind of stuff too, with the, with the Mercedes and the BMWs and the Audis and all that. Right. Of course, you're going to buy Italian. You get your Lambo, your Ferrari. It's going to be beautiful. Right. But it's not going to be super efficient because a lot of that stuff is handmade, like your Maseratis. Right. Then, of course, you've got the, you know, the American made, which is super, you know, quality's gotten a lot better, super affordable compared to a lot of those competitors. Right. But even American industry, it's not so much made in Detroit anymore. Remember, they have had those comparative advantages and saying, OK, let's go to Mexico. Right. Let's make things there. Right? It might be the parts might be made in the United States, but then it gets assembled in Mexico because it's cheaper to come back to the United States. Now, agglomeration oftentimes is connected to location of infrastructure, the roadways, the highways, the railways, the ports, the airports, the electrical grid, the water power, all those kinds of things. So generally where there's a good advantageous location, there's going to be a lot of agglomeration. Detroit, I mentioned, was a very famous example historically. Right. Once the Ford company was there, a lot of other car companies, you know, Chrysler, for example, Dodge located in that area of Michigan as well. Um, General Motors. Right. Obviously, in that same location. Right. There used to be the you know big GM tower in Detroit. Right. Which is the global headquarters of GM. When you think about all of that agglomeration. Right. Sometimes it gets too clustered and then you might see a phenomenon known as deglomeration where they start to spread out and go to other places. That has happened in the United States as a lot of car manufacturing now has moved out of Detroit. And a lot of times they, they've shifted into the southern states. We'll talk about that in just a second. Right. So companies, how can they agglomerate? Again, they, they cluster together for competitive advantages. Sometimes um, this happens even in retail. This is why CVS and, and Walgreens are usually across the street from each other. It's why gas stations often cluster at one exit on the highway. Instead of one gas station per exit, they'd rather all four or five be at one so that they can compete. Because sometimes you'll see and you go, oh, it's two pennies cheaper over here. Let me go over there, right? The fast food places, they tend to agglomerate. Home Depot and Lowe's, they agglomerate, right? And they want to compete. So they figure that they better be right near their competitor in order to do that. But again, sometimes the, the agglomeration could be too much. And what we saw in the last chapter is that a lot of businesses that were in the downtown CBD, 
they, they fled out to the suburban areas that became edge cities as they developed their own downtown areas. Um, and now we can certainly see that, for example, with corporate parks in places like Boca, right? The IBM campus was, uh, you know, where Don Estridge Middle School is now. That's why it's the high tech middle school. Don Estridge was the guy who led the IBM personal computer project. Uh, you know, I don't know if a lot of them kids know, you know, Boca Raton is the birthplace of the PC. Right. So when you think about this, uh, a lot of times agglomeration is a big effect. All right. Now, I mentioned cars and I mentioned that we were going to talk about shifting into the southern states. Um, the green is foreign car companies. So Honda, Hyundai, Toyota, Nissan, examples like that. Uh, BMW, Mercedes, they have facilities in the United States now, too. Uh, the red is U.S. owned. And again, so you're talking Ford, you're talking General Motors, you're talking Chrysler Corporation, that kind of thing. Um, and notice a lot of it has shifted into Canada. Uh, it doesn't show us on the map, but a lot has shifted into Mexico. You'll notice there's not a lot in the Western United States because remember, two thirds of the U.S. population lives east of the Mississippi River. So this is a bulk gaining activity. How can I tell? Because the manufacturing location is market oriented. It's close to the people who are going to be buying the cars. Uh, there's actually a corridor there between I-65 and I-75. Almost all car manufacturing in America goes down that corridor. Now, there are new disruptive companies. Tesla, for example, right? Elon Musk. So Tesla actually got an old GM factory in California that the California state government gave them the, the factory for free because, or at a super discounted rate, you could look up the story, but they wanted Tesla to be there because they knew it would create jobs. Now, Elon Musk famously has recently said that, I don't know if we're going to stay in California because it's too expensive and they're, you know, we're going to move to Texas where it's cheaper. Okay. And we're going to talk about a lot of these factors, site and situation factors, because you know, site and situation. We've talked about those terms before. Just so you know, this picture right here was an essay question a couple of years ago on the AP exam, and it wanted kids to talk about the where and the why there of car manufacturing, right? Using costs of transportation, costs of labor, agglomeration or clustering effects, all kinds of things, the cost of the land, the cost of the labor, the cost of the transportation. Now, remember, models can't do everything right? The models are highly simplistic generalizations. So what did Weber not really talk about? You'll notice he didn't say anything about raw materials. He considered that raw materials were ubiquitous, right? But Japan doesn't have raw materials like other countries in the world. That's why Japan in the 1930s got so aggressive with their neighbors taking over parts of China. Almost all of Asia became a Japanese sphere, right? Which led them into conflict with the United States didn't turn out so well for the Japanese, if you remember your World War II history, right? But not every country in the world has, you know, the raw materials, right? The United States, we're blessed. We have a tremendous amount of raw materials, right? And, and certainly we don't have to go scouring the world for raw materials like some countries do. But there are places in the world where raw materials are very, very rich. Africa, for example, has a lot of rare earths, right? And a lot of special metals and minerals. And what you're seeing is that Europe and China, and, and to some degree, even the United States, is engaging in competition for these rare earths and for these special minerals that, you know, that Africa has tremendous amounts of, right? Um, if you look at Europe historically, right, they tried to control uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, particularly the British. Now, instead of the colonialism and the imperialism of the old days, there's still this neo-colonialism now, a commodity dependence, which we'll talk about. Oil is a great example of this. Coffee is a good example of this. Chocolate is a good example of this. Things we talked about in Unit 5, okay, with agriculture. Sometimes these groups create cartels to try and control the supply and the demand of a product. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries is a good example, or OPEC, which controls oil. Um, obviously, speaking of oil, energy, um, you know, it's not so much coal driven as it was historically because of climate change and global warming. Uh, a lot of countries have committed to becoming carbon neutral by 2030, by 2035, 2040. 
Uh, a lot of big American companies have been doing this to change scale, not just at a national scale, but more uh, local. Walmart and Amazon have both pledged to be carbon neutral. Okay. So the role of government is, is part of that. What if there's environmental regulations? What if there's, um, you know, in a, in a less developed country, what if there's a, a, a revolution? Look what's happening in Myanmar, right? If I had a factory in Myanmar because it had great cheap labor, but then the government gets overthrown by a military junta and the whole country descends into chaos, well, that's going to affect my business, right? So taxation is a big part of this. Um, the right to work laws in the southern states of the United States, they're generally, uh, they have a dim view of unions, right? Unions are typically more left on the political spectrum. You see the states of the Midwest, you know, the Michigans and the Wisconsins, all right, are, are areas where union activity is very high, but that adds to cost because unions advocate for their members. They want them to get paid more, have better benefits, have better working conditions. All of those things sound great, but they increase the cost of the product, which means that the consumer has to pay more, right? That's one thing when Japan brought uh, their car factories over to the United States in the 80s, the American car companies really had a hard time competing because the Japanese were famously, they didn't have unions, right? Everybody was the same. The CEO and the guy working on the factory line, they ate lunch together, right? And, and there was no separation. So everybody was a team, right? Japanese, they're, they're famous for the idea of teamwork. Everybody's together right? Japanese companies had a hard time when they first went to India, because in India, there was still this idea of the caste system. What do you mean I'm going to eat lunch with, you know, people from a different ethnic or social group, right? That just, that was anathema to, you know, the Indian workers. But the Japanese were like, hey, if you want us to come here and do business, you're going to have to do it the way we want to do it, right? Otherwise, we'll just go somewhere else, right? We'll build a car factory somewhere else. So when you think about this, none of these things were things that Weber really considered. He only looked at transportation, the cost of the labor, and those agglomeration effects. Now, a little pop quiz, site and situation. I'll take a second. I'll let you read through. A lot of the things I just talked about, they're right here. Would they be site factors or physical things? Would they be situational factors? All right, so criticisms of Weber. We know that no model is perfect, right? Um, there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, see exceptions where we can see that, you know, Weber is uh, on the right track. You know, that he definitely had a model that could could help us think about location of industry. But as you read through this slide, you'll be able to see that, uh, you know, Weber is not always 100 percent reliable or precise. OK, so when we think about um, all of that manufacturing. Right. We we have to understand the other half of this unit is industry and economic development. Industry is often thought of as being the key to economic development. Countries that are primarily agricultural are not highly developed. Right. But once you go through your industrial revolution, once you go through that uh, process, a country becomes richer. OK, so what does development mean in that sense? Historically. We used to divide the world, and, and you sometimes hear your parents, maybe your grandparents, talk about third world countries, right? Well, what does that actually mean in context? The first world was the United States and their allies, the free world, the free market economies. The second world was made up of hardline communist dictatorships. Are there second world countries still in the world today? Yes. North Korea is a great example of a second world hardline communist dictatorship. The third world was basically everybody else. And, and, and that wasn't very nice because, I mean, first of all, if you're doing this in rank order, first, second, <laughs> you're third. <laughs> you're the second loser. So, you know, people said third world, but it, it just, you know, the people in the third world, they didn't like that. They didn't like being considered as being, you know, last, so to speak. All right. Fourth world usually meant a state that was in crisis. Syria would be a great example of a state in crisis where the government is collapsing and, you know, resorting to chemically gassing their own citizens to try and stay in political power. And then fifth world was usually used to denote a state which became known as a failed state where the government ultimately collapsed. And oftentimes people use Somalia as an example of a failed state, right, where Somalia has basically disintegrated 
where there is no national authority. It's regional groups controlling different areas of the country, but without the framework of a national system of government. Well, about the 1990s or so, these terms, first world, second world, third world, fourth world, fifth world, they became kind of passe. They became kind of inappropriate. And instead, people started talking about countries that were developed, meaning the ones that were wealthy, urbanized, industrialized, low fertility, high education, you know, those kinds of opportunities. And then there were those that were either underdeveloped or they might be developing, right? And it's like, yay, come on, you can do it. You're developing. Go get to that finish line. The reality is, were those countries really ever going to get to the same level as the wealthy developed countries? Okay. So some economies have progressed. We talked about, for example, South Korea. South Korea in the 1950s was one of the poorest countries in the world. Today, look at all the products that you have that are South Korean. You know, anything LG, anything Samsung. I mean, they're a huge player in the global economy. But yet, just a few decades ago, they were where you see some of the poorest countries in the world today. So we know that countries are capable of development. But what will the conditions be that have to be in place for that to actually happen? But when you say developing, you're assuming that they can do it, right? And again, that's that cheerleader effect. Come on, Brazil. Come on, India. You're there. You're almost there. Let's go, right? So then they started using terms like MDC and LDC, more developed countries, less developed countries. You still hear this a lot. It'll, it'll, it'll be in our slideshow. It's in our textbook sometimes, right? More developed and less developed. They've kind of replaced the whole developed and the developing. But the reality is, if you remember Hans, remember back at the beginning of the year when I showed you that video with Hans? Don't panic. And yeah, it was about population. It was about a lot of things, girl education. And, you know, development was a big part of that video, right? The reality is most people in the world today have moved out of that poorest segment. Do you remember the $1 and the $10 and the $100 economies? You know, yeah, we're living in that $100 world, $100 a day or more, right? Those $10 a day economies, right? We look at them and we think they're equally poor to the $1, but trust me, the $1 people look at the $10 people and they say, oh my God, if I could just add a zero, you know, if somebody came up and added a zero to your income, holy cow. Instead of making tens of thousands, you're making hundreds of thousands. Instead of hundreds of thousands, you're making millions. Can you imagine? Instead of being a millionaire, now you're suddenly a billionaire. <laughs> you know, adding zeros is an incredible thing, right? So Hans talks about the measurement of countries. He says, uh, this is a very famous quote. And of course, we all know, sadly, Hans is no longer with us, right? Uh, I have a neighbor who knows 200 types of wine. OK, you've got your Cabernets, your Pinot Noirs, you've got your Zinfandels, you know, you've got, you know, all kinds of grapes, all kinds of terroir all around the world. Maybe some of your parents like to collect different bottles and they've got refrigerators full of wines from all over the world. And Dad goes to Total Wine every weekend. Right. I, you know, he says, I have a neighbor. He knows 200 kinds of wine. He goes, I only know two. There's there's red wine. There's white wine. That's all I know. He said, but my neighbor only knows two kinds of countries, the ones that are developed and the ones that are not, right? He says, I know 200 kinds of countries because the reality is we have almost 200 countries in the world and all of them are at different levels, but all of them are capable, right, of achieving greater levels of development, both economically as well as societally, okay? So how do we measure development if we had a yardstick, right? If we had some sort of tool that we could. Well, sometimes we use quantitative statistics and sometimes we use qualitative statistics. Remember that this is two big skills on your AP Human Geography exam. If they give you charts of GDP and all kinds of HDI and things like that, if it's statistical, it's going to be those economic indicators. If you talk about quality of life, if you talk about the happiness index that the king of Bhutan developed, because after all, they're a poor country. They're never going to compete with the rest of the world. They were the last country in the world to get, you know, cable television, for example, right? But I've been to a lot of poor countries in the world where people were incredibly happy. We walked kids through a slum 
in, in Cape Town. We went to the Langa Township. And our students from Boca, whose families make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, were playing with children that, you know, their families live on less than a dollar a day. But these little children, they wanted to be picked up. They wanted to play soccer. They wanted to, you know, interact. They wanted to, you know, talk. They wanted to meet these American kids. And these little kids, they were so happy. They were just so delighted that we were there. So when we think about indicators, one of the most obvious ones is what we call GDP, gross domestic product. It's the total value of all the goods and services that's produced in a country over a year's time. Um, in order to make comparisons, we can't really use these big mass variables because obviously China's GDP is going to be way bigger than Guatemala's GDP because China has you know 1.3 billion people and it's an enormous economy. Uh, but if you take China's economy and you divide it by 1.3 billion people, that big GDP number as a whole number, a mass value, that number gets real small when you talk about per capita or per person, per head, right? So when we think about these statistics, we have to be careful of the reliability. And remember, it's nowadays a global economy. It's not just measuring what you do inside your country. So we now have what we call G&I, gross national income which takes a global look, right, at American companies like Walmart and Amazon that are operating all over the world because they contribute to the GNI of the United States. So we have to be careful also with these statistics because remember that the poorest billion people in the world, they don't get a paycheck. They don't have a 401k plan. They don't have paid time off. They don't get maternity leave. They don't have health care plans. They're doing the side hustle right? They're doing the informal economy, right? The formal economy is taxed and regulated, right? We watched that little video on Dhaka. And if the Bangladeshi government could get, you know, all of these barbers and fruit vendors and rickshaw drivers, if they all had a license, if they all paid tax, if they all were part of the formal economy, but they're not, they're in the informal economy, the cash that people pay under the table, it's not regulated by the government. It's not part of the official figures. So GDP, uh, it doesn't really account for all of the economic activity, particularly in the poorest countries of the world, right? But historically, the big key was industry. So this is GDP. And by the way, global GDP right now, it's, a, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $77 trillion, depending on the source you look up, okay? $77 trillion, right? That's a lot of zeros, right? What's the biggest economy in the world? We are still the United States. China is close, right? It's right behind, right? Europe as a whole, if you take the European Union and their GDP, then it's going to also be on par between the United States, China, and, and the EU. India's economy is still very big. Japan's economy is very, very big. Um, you know, Mexico's economy is big, regionally speaking. We have to change scale. And, and notice that when we look at something like a cartogram here, right, the size of the country, lower left-hand corner is more of our realistic sizing, right? That's a Peter's projection. You notice that Africa's really long there and Greenland's really small. If it was Mercator, remember, it would be the other way around. Greenland would be enormous. But when you look at the earth in its you correct sizing in the lower left-hand corner. Then you look and look at Africa and it just goes away, right? And that's because GDP-wise, the African economies are super small. Look at look at South America. Really only Brazil is, is somewhat big there. And then you can certainly see that in, in Africa, South Africa is bigger, right? Egypt is bigger, right? When you look at Asia, Japan is that really, really, really big one there. OK, South Korea is that bigger. The one that's between Japan and China is the South Korean economy. So we can actually see this and we can look at GDP. Right. Or you could do it kind of quantitatively like this. And you could look at the actual numbers and you look at that U.S. economy. Now, again, that number is about a year old. We've spent almost three trillion dollars on fighting covid. Uh, so when we think about the size of our economy, uh, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the new numbers are looking like, but we are usually about one quarter of the global economy. Okay. If you add up the U S plus China plus Europe, and then go ahead and throw in Japan and, you know, the, you know, 
usually the other bigger ones, the whole rest of the world is about 10% of the entire global economy. Think about that. Okay. Now, remember, we can change scale. Let's look at GDP of Texas versus the GDP of Russia. Okay. Because what's interesting here is you see that their, their total GDPs are not all that terribly different. 1.7 versus 1.28, 1.3. Somewhat similar. But yet Russia has, you know, 145 million people. So Texas is like 30 times five, right? So Texas is one fifth of Russia's population. Same GDP-ish, but then divide that out per person, right? And this is not income. This is not the average income. It's the total value of the goods and the services divided by the people that are there in a dollar value, okay? If we want to measure income, we look at different statistics that way. But look at the difference. This is Russia, right, versus Texas, right? Sometimes you'll hear people say, if California were its own country, it would be the fifth biggest economy in the world. Just California. Florida's economy is huge, right? But change scale in the United States. Think about what South Dakota's economy looks like, right? Or what Mississippi's economy looks like. It's a lot lower. Remember, we have to change scale. And I just mentioned South Dakota, Mississippi. Okay, let me take you somewhere where you're maybe not as familiar. Let's go look at the provinces of China. China has a huge GDP on a national scale. But then you look at the provincial scale, the regional levels of China, and you can see that places like close to Shanghai and Beijing have tremendously high GDP. And then you look at the places that are way out in the periphery of the country have much lower levels of GDP. So it's very important that when you look at a GDP number, you start to ask yourself, where's the limitation of this data? Remember, they love to ask that question on the exam, right? They give you a chart like this. What's the limitation of this data? Hey, if they showed you China as a national number, you'd say, well, I want to see this map. I want to see how it breaks down by region. Okay. And if they show you regional, well, then I want to see the local level. How does that affect it? Okay. So it's always important to change scale. Remember that there are other ways that we can show development. Um, this one is also an economic indicator, the occupational structure of the labor force. What percentage of people are in agriculture? What percentage of people are in manufacturing or services, right? Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quinary. I put one, two, three, four, five. It's easier, okay? Um, we're going to talk about dependency ratio. How many people, either young and old, are not working as a proportion of 100 working people, right? Remember, uh, those of us that are working and paying tax are supporting the people who are not working. Right, either the retirees like my dad, and we love to joke with him, he's a freeloader <laughs> because he's getting checks now, right? Because he worked his life and he paid into the social security system, but now he's getting money out. He doesn't even have to file a tax return anymore because he doesn't have enough money coming in to be able to have to pay income tax, right? And, and social security is, is, is one of those things that you know, it, it's you know, you depend on it. You hope it's going to be there in the future, but for your age, I don't know, maybe not. Um, but you could also be a youth dependent, right? You guys aren't working. Well, some of you have a job. Some of you have a job, but many of you don't. And that means that you're a dependent, right? So we're going to talk about dependency. We're going to talk about HDI, which is used to calculate health, wealth, and education. Uh, a, ra a ranking of zero in HDI would be terrible. That would be very low. Uh, if you get to the number one, you are perfectly developed. Here's a fun fact. No country in the world is at one, but there are some countries that are above 0.9. We'll talk about it. Um, and then don't forget that gender is a big part of this too, because wherever in the world you're measuring, women are never as well off as men are. And there's what we sometimes call the gender inequality index, which measures the difference between men and women in terms of economic and social opportunities. There's also a statistic called the gender empowerment measure, which looks at women's role in government, women's role in decision making, right? Women's role in executive positions in, in, in employment. There's also a thing called the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a really cool measurement of income inequality on a scale of zero to one or 100. And zero would mean everybody makes the same amount of money, right? Everybody's the same. One would mean that it's perfectly unequal, 
meaning one person makes all of the money and nobody else makes anything. Now, I always love to talk about this one because, for example, what if it was Jeff Bezos and me or, you know, Elon Musk and me, right? You know, on average, we've got $75 billion. <laughs> I've got close to zero. They have $150 billion, right? So when we think about the Gini coefficient, these numbers are, they're fun to look at and they're interesting to make observations, but we have to be careful where we take these numbers and what are the limitations of the data. There's even one, there's a magazine called The Economist, and every year they publish what's known as the Big Mac Index. And so many countries in the world have a McDonald's. So what they do is they take the purchasing power parity, they account for currency fluctuation, they look at the value of a dollar, say, in the Norwegian currency or the Pakistani currency, and then they say, how much does a Big Mac cost, right? Assuming all other things are equal, how much does the Big Mac cost? And they call it the Big Mac index. By the way, look how many of these things you could define, that you could identify, that you could describe, that you could explain, that you could compare. Wouldn't these be great essay questions? Be ready. AP exam's coming. Occupational structure. United States, Brazil, Nepal. Primary, secondary, tertiary workers. They don't always show us quaternary and quinary because those are kind of parts of tertiary. But look at the United States. Less than 2% of Americans pull something out of the ground. 75% of Americans are involved in some sort of tertiary service. Well, look at Nepal. It's like the other way around. 81% of the country is farmers, right? Only 3% are engaged in manufacturing. And then you look at a country like Brazil. Okay, they're still farmers. They grow coffee. They grow sugar. They grow all kinds of agricultural products. And there's a big, vibrant manufacturing sector because Brazil is one of those cheap labor locations that's emerging in the world economy. And yeah, there's a big service market for Brazilians providing services to other Brazilians. And tourism is a big part of that too. So what we could say here is, let's look at the occupational structure. We see a country that's more developed. We see a country that's less developed. We see a country that's developing, right? You could see it right there with the data. But again, what's the limitation of the data? This doesn't always tell us the quality of life or whether the people are happy. And we certainly can't see things like COVID infections, which Brazil right now is leading the world in COVID deaths, right? So we, we look at these kinds of things and always be careful that, that it is data and, and what are we using the data for? Now, I mentioned dependency ratios, right? This is a website called Our World and Data. Really cool website to go check out if you want to look at quantitative data. And this is old age dependency. Well, we know this from unit two. Remember, there was an essay question. What happens as a country ages? Okay, well, we got to take care of all these old people, all these retirees. Now, look at this. You know, the richer countries have a lot of old people. We know this because of population statistics. Now, look at youth dependency. Do you realize that if you toggle back and forth, you're getting an opposite image of the same map. Now it's all the people under the age of 15. And we know, remember Nigeria, right? Where, where half the country is under the age of 15. We know that in the next couple of decades, Nigeria is going to triple in population. So we need to understand that this is a class where you can't learn and dump. If you get an essay and it talks about dependency, you need to go back and talk about things like fertility and things like education for girls. And, and obviously that affects agriculture and it affects rural to urban migration. And all of the things we've learned in this class this year can be done with one of these visual stimulus. Now, HDI, they call it the Human Development Index. Remember I said health, wealth, and education, okay? Now they put health on the left-hand side. How long can we expect, expect somebody to, to live? healthier countries, you live longer, right? So if the life expectancy is low, you're going to get a low health number, all right? Wealth, standard of living, G and P. Now remember, GDP, gross domestic product, GNP, gross national product. That's that one I talked about, gross national income. But again, it's still going to take a money indicator, okay? So remember, economic indicators as well as social indicators, HDI looks at both in the same statistic. It's like a, a basket of indicators, okay? Health, wealth, education, the average ed educational level. In the United States, we expect that you're going to finish at least 13 years, right? K through 12. 
but a lot of Americans then continue on. 50% of Americans go to college, but only 25% of Americans finish that degree. Remember, that's why as a freshman, if you're taking an AP class, that's a great head start. Here's what HDI looks like around the world. And you can see that the countries that are the highest, please don't make fun of my disability, but I'm going to go out on a limb that's either really dark blue or some kind of purple. But you got the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, uh, Germany, the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, all very, very high levels. The UK, uh, those kinds of places, very low levels of HDI because what? Health is going to be low. Wealth is going to be low. Education is going to be low. You can see that some places there in um, sub-Saharan Africa can be kind of low. Even certain parts of Latin America can be low. Notice that India is much lower than, say, China, right? But notice that China is even lower than Europe, than Japan, than the United States, Canada. So there's a lot of great data in here right, that you can certainly look at. And remember, they might ask you to explain, tell me how or why, and tell me how they're working on solving some of these problems. Now, HDI as a whole, and then let's look at it from the perspective of women, right? So gender inequality, we now measure on a scale of zero to one, how equal are women? Zero would mean that women have nothing. One would mean that women are Almost, uh, sorry, one would mean that it's the other way around where you've got scores between one higher value, more inequality. Please forgive me. So you look at the countries like Afghanistan, really low. Yemen, right? Really low, right? In fact, it's probably close to one. Um, whereas you look at, you know, Western Europe and you look at like China, for example, Australia, for example, uh, where women are getting close to equality. But remember, even in the best countries for equality, women still don't make the same amount of money as men. They don't have the same opportunities as men. Uh, they don't have the same uh, roles in government. They don't have the same standards in the family in terms of gender relationships in the home. This is a big part. Uh, topic 7.4 in our slideshow is all about women in development. And look at women in government. You know, only 25% of the, of the Congresses of the world are women sitting in those seats. Most of the time, it's a lot of men, right? And in, and in the richer countries, a lot of old white dudes, right? A lot of boomers. And you look at heads of government or heads of state, right? The head of state is the actual government, you know, like a president or a prime minister, an elected position. Head of government might be a monarch, might be a queen, might be something like that, right? But again, even when you change scale, even when you look at um, and by the way, it says women in parliaments globally. They mean around the world, but they're looking at the national level of government. And then you look at down below, you see the percentage of women in local assemblies. And that would be like, you know, in cities, right? Do we have women mayors? Do we have women sitting on the county commissioners and on the school board and those kinds of things, right? And the numbers just aren't very good. It's not really equal. Well, a lot of times this is because women get paid less than men. And for example, these maquiladoras, if you've ever heard that term before, a maquiladora is a factory. Uh, historically, they were in Mexico. They were right on the border of the United States uh, with the coming of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is now the United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement. Uh, you know, the idea of free trade between the North American partners, a lot of jobs shifted to Mexico, particularly jobs that were not super skilled. Uh, obviously, it takes some kind of skill to sew, but we're not talking about, you know, the most difficult jobs, but women oftentimes got paid less than men. They still do. Uh, but women are oftentimes desirable for employers because they'll work hard. They're very productive. They're very dexterous with their hands. And so you see a lot in the seamstresses here, you see just women all across these factory floors. This is not just in Latin America. This is in places like Bangladesh, where, again, big clothing industry. And again, remember I told you, the where are you wearing? So you actually may see made in Bangladesh. You may even see nowadays made in Lesotho, right, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, the country that's inside South Africa as an enclave. Now, what has happened sometimes lately is that we see that women are the key to development, right? Remember, education for girls, standards of women, lowering TFR, increasing opportunities for women and girls. So there's this new phenomenon in recent decades, what they call microcredit or microfinance. 
micro lending, small amounts of money to you and me, a couple hundred dollars maybe. But if you put that couple hundred dollars in the hands of a woman in a rural village, right, in a small town where she's going to become an entrepreneur, where she's going to maybe sew clothes or she's going to, you know, sell fruit in a vendor stand or she's going to uh, plant a little vegetable garden and she's going to sell it at the marketplace. She may hire her neighbors. She may spend the money on educating girls. These microfinance programs are a massive tool in leveraging all right, that small amount of money all right, on a local scale, but large amounts of money nationally and regionally, and then globally, it impacts the status of women all over the world. Right? And one of those great examples is a company called the Grameen Bank, which was one of the first to do this through these microcredit programs, particularly in India. But now you can find this all over Africa, all over Latin America, all over Asia, where these microcredit facilities are operating. Women, by the way, they're also much more faithful at paying the money back. Uh, the only drawback sometimes is that men don't always love it when the woman has her own money. Because remember, the status of women is also about gender relationships in the home. And when the man no longer controls right, the, the woman's life, sometimes there is going to be uh, friction or tension. And in, and in severe cases, this is where we sometimes see... Um, you know, spousal abuse and battery. And that's that's something that is just terribly unfortunate. And, and it's important to remember that that happens across all societies, all religions, all cultures, all race and ethnicity groups, all nationality groups. We can find uh, that, that sometimes those gender uh, conflicts are existing. But uh, microcredit attempts, again, to enhance and empower women and give them an opportunity at, at a better life and increasing that, that happiness index. Now, when we think about the Gini coefficient, I mentioned that a second ago, the inequality. Remember, zero would be perfectly equal. 100 would be perfectly unequal. Okay. Now, look at your list of countries that are more equal. Slovenia, Ukraine, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Norway. Notice those are all European countries. Right? They tend to be on that socialist side, you know, you know, socioeconomically and politically. And notice that there's a huge equality across the society. And then the United States, by the way, we're kind of 45 on a scale of zero to 100. So we're kind of right there in the middle. Yes, we've got fabulously rich people, but yes, we also have poor people. So we do have some income inequality especially when you consider that, you know, the robber barons like the Carnegie's and the DuPont's and the Rockefeller's, they made multiple times what their workers made. But if you look at a comparison, the CEOs of today, what they make compared to their workers versus what the Carnegie's made compared to their workers, it is blown all out of proportion now, right? When you look at what an Elon Musk makes versus what a, a worker at Tesla makes, right? Now, here's what's interesting. Look at the countries with the widest disparity between rich and poor. And this is something that I've told you guys before. You need to remember this. Sometimes, even in the poorest countries, there are tremendously rich people. So look at South Africa, the worst inequality, right? We took kids to South Africa and we went to places where it looked exactly like Boca, huge mansions, people driving Maybachs, right? And then you go across the street and there's people living in cardboard boxes, that's a lot of income inequality. Well, look at this. South Africa, Central African Republic, Botswana, Namibia, all sub-Saharan Africa, all right? Haiti in the Western Hemisphere. It's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere by far. But there's fabulously rich Haitian people. Many of them, all right, obviously immigrate to the United States. Their kids come to American colleges. Now, what's the only real benefit sometimes out of this is there's remittances where those families may send money back to Haiti and this sometimes happens in the African countries as well, right? You get a Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang who comes and plays for the Arsenal, right? And he's Gabonese. And then he goes back home to Gabon and he's making it rain, you know, all around his local community and hiring people in Gabon to do charity work and things like that, right? But there's a tremendous income inequality between the richest and the poorest. I mentioned that Big Mac Index. You can look at the chart here. If you want, you can Google search the Big Mac Index and read all about it. Uh, you can also say, in addition to 
what is the price of the Big Mac, you could say, well, how long does it take to earn a Big Mac? Because, for example, Zimbabwe famously, their currency became so hyperinflated and devalued that it took $100 billion to buy three eggs, right? I used to have, right? You remember I have that money wall in my classroom, right? A long time ago, I had a, a money wall that was totally done. And somehow in the summertime, a bunch of I don't know, some, maybe somebody working in the school over the summer, they ripped that money wall out of the wall. They, I'll show you the holes in my classroom. They literally stole the money wall off the wall. I had a $50 trillion bill. Maybe that's why they took it. They thought that was $50 trillion, but it was $50 trillion in Zimbabwe, which was totally worthless, right? But I, I'm so upset because I, I used to have a $50 trillion bill. It was so cool. Well, when I went to South Africa, I actually started haggling with people in the market that were Zimbabwean and, and they were selling Zimbabwean money. This is really what Zimbabwean money is worth today, right? Somebody will pay you to, to as a collector's item, as, as a really cool thing. And, and I was talking to these uh, guys and I was trying, I was offering them $50 US, but I wanted a $50 trillion bill. And they kept saying, oh, I don't have a 50 trillion. I got a, I got a hundred billion. I got 500 billion. I was like, no, I want 50 trillion. I'm giving you 50 US dollars. I want 50 trillion Zimbabwean dollars, right? Uh, but that's why we say sometimes you have to account for the currency. How long in time do you have to work to make a Big Mac? Well, when you're making 725 an hour in the United States, you don't have to work that long, right? The Big Mac's about three, four dollars. You might even work 20, 30 minutes. But if you go to Nairobi, Kenya, you're going to be working two, three hours to make the amount of money that it's going to need to be able to buy a big money. All right, let's shift gears. Let's talk about our models. We have two big models in this unit, right? And, and I'm almost at about 90 minutes here. So I'm going to try and speed up and get you done so that you can remember, you can chunk this. You can watch it bit by bit by bit. You don't have to watch two hours at a time. Um, but we have two big models in this unit where we talk about development. Um, one of them is a liberal model. The other one is a structuralist model. Liberal models believe that change can happen. The structuralist models say that the system is, way, is the way it is and it's not likely to change, okay? Our primary liberal model is a guy named Walter Rostow. Uh, he actually worked in the John F. Kennedy administration in the 1960s. He was a big proponent of the Peace Corps. He thought that that would help poor countries develop. Fun fact, the Peace Corps was also envisioned as a way to combat the spread of communism because if you let the poor countries suffer, they're likely to turn to communism. Remember, Kennedy was a big kind of uh, battler against the spread of communism, uh, especially in Cuba, where we didn't exactly you know, uh, succeed in stopping the spread of communism. But liberal models like Rostow, they believe that all countries can develop. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about Ross Dow in a minute. The structuralist model. The biggest one is Emmanuel Wallerstein. You've heard me talk about this before. This is that uh, world systems theory or world systems analysis. It's the idea of the core and the periphery and the semi periphery. The beautiful thing about this model is you can use it at multiple scales. It doesn't just work in terms of country development. You can look at the core of a city, the periphery and the semi periphery and all that. So it's interchangeable. It can be used a lot of different ways. Now, shout out to my friend David Palmer, right, uh, who's now happily retired in Colorado. Uh, but his book tells you all about these two models. And even more important, his book goes into detail about criticisms of these models. Remember, they often might ask you, what are the limitations of these theories, right? Um, use the theory in a specified context. Show me an actual country. There was a question a couple of years ago on the exam where they said, talk about Mexico and talk about Brazil in both the Rostow sense and in the world systems analysis sense, right? Well, in the world systems analysis, they're both semi-peripheral. In the Rostow model, they're both kind of on that stage three, stage four level. So Mexico and Brazil are similar in both models, but you had to compare. Remember, as soon as you see something where there's two things and they're kind of married to each other, be ready for that verb compare to be in your essay. All right. Here's uh, Rostow in a nutshell. They sometimes call this the ladder of development from one to five. And by the way, I'm up there over the top of the number five. High mass consumption is the fifth stage. 
So from a traditional to preconditions to take off to the drive to maturity to the high mass consumption over time, a country can develop through this ladder of development. Well, where else have we seen that? We've seen that with the epidemiologic transition where countries go from infectious disease to more chronic disease over time. We've seen that with the demographic transition where countries go from high birth and high death to low birth and low death over time. And the reality is this model and those models, it's they weren't designed together. Like the people who made the models didn't get together and go, hey, your model looks good. My model looks good. Let's use them together. It didn't work like that. But the reality is we can look at countries today in an analytical sense and we can say, wow, a country that's moving through Rostyle stages is probably also going through the demographic transition, is probably also going through the epidemiologic transition. And wouldn't that be a great essay to be able to talk about the connectivity? Okay. So, you know, just for a second, right? Toggle back and forth if you want to go through the slideshow a second and look at this and then look at this, right? And, and just start to connect how those things all, you know, go together, right? Because that's what we really need to see is that the liberal model there, it really has a lot of applicability to, uh, you know, demographic transition, epidemiologic transition, right? I'll give you a second. All right. Now, the world systems analysis. Ross Dow was very liberal. This one's very structuralist, right? Uh, his belief is that there is a single global economy, okay? That's the first thing you have to assume with his model. Everybody's in the same economy. Now, in Ross Dow's sense, one of the big criticisms, he only looked at each country, one country at a time. Well, you know, Mexico benefits from being right next door to the United States, right? I mean, Mongolia is next door to communist China. That's not really going to help them a whole lot in the global economy. So where Rostow only looked at a national scale, this is a global system, right? It's the world system analysis. And he said the world is divided into three tiers. We've got a core, we've got a periphery, we've got a semi-periphery. It's been that way since 1450, according to Wallerstein. What happens in 1450, you might ask? This is when the European countries started to explore and started to export their guns, their germs, and their steel, and took over the world in a geopolitical you know, framework of mercantilism, colonialism, imperialism, which until recently all right, had been the system, right? Obviously, decolonization after World War II, countries in Africa becoming independent in the 1960s. But for 500 years, it was enslavement, it was taking away their raw materials. It was, you know, dominating them militaristically from far away, exporting their, their system of government. The legacy, of course, through language and religion, the spread of Christianity, the Indo-European languages like English and Spanish and French and Portuguese. I mean, again, think about the essay opportunities that they might ask you and how many different units you could bring into you know, that answer. You could talk about cultural geography, economic geography. You could talk about agriculture, meaning that, the, you know, the chocolate producers versus the chocolate consumers. There's so many things that they could ask you. Now, one down and dirty way, and we've talked about this in class, to divide the world is you could draw a line across the world and say, okay, global rich, uh, globally rich north, globally poor south. That down and dirty line is pretty much the equator. There was a guy named Willy Brandt. He was the chancellor of Germany in the 1960s. And he became famous for talking about the fact that this equator basically split the world into have and have not. Well, you could do the same thing on a regional basis or even on a national basis. In China, they have a famous uh, phenomenon, what they call the noodle line, that above the noodle line, China tends to be richer. And below the noodle line, where they eat a lot of rice, they tend to be poorer. OK, and so if you look at you know, go back in the slideshow where I showed you that GDP of China broken down by the different provinces, you can actually see this phenomenal effect. OK, now, should we assume that all countries can develop? Right. I don't know that the countries that are in the worst Gini coefficient right, are going to make it. But you could take, for example, South Africa and you could say, wow, really poor overall really big income inequality, 
But at the same time, South Africa, compared to all of the other African economies, is by far the most developed and the most well-off with the most education and with the most business opportunities. So should we say that a country can never develop? I don't think we should. Should we say that all countries are equally capable of development? I don't know if that's necessarily true. The reality is, I think when you think like a geographer, you have to look at the site and you have to look at the situational factors, and then you have to make an assessment. All right, what does the data indicate? Both the qualitative data, where you have to do the source analysis, as well as the quantitative data, where you're going to acquire the numbers and the statistics. All right, here's your global economy on a Wallerstein basis, okay? And so you look at the core countries, right? The United States, Canada, most of Western Europe, Japan, Australia, right? All good examples of core economies. The semi-periphery, remember we talk about the BRIC countries in the slideshow. I know it's in the David Palmer book as well. Brazil, Russia, India, China, those BRIC countries. Most of our tigers are on here. South Korea is on there. Uh, you can see Taiwan. Singapore is probably too small, right? It's a little point there, a little Singapore. Um, but you can see the, the mint countries that they now talk about. Mexico, uh, you know, Nigeria, Turkey, you know, those are starting to become. So the map would change depending on the, on the, on the quality of the statistics and the, and, the, and the recentness of the data that we're looking at. But this is basically a Wallerstein arrangement. Same thing here when you use your Brandt line to kind of show that. But again, there's always exceptions, right? Europe, we think of it as being pretty wealthy, but Western Europe is much more wealthy than Eastern Europe. The Eastern European part that was behind the Iron Curtain from the Soviet era, definitely not as well off economically as the Western part. Now, another way we can look at the world is we can look at what we call the dependency theory. Now, be careful. This is not the same as the dependency ratio. Dependency ratio is the people who don't work, like young and old people, compared to the 100 working people. This is dependency theory. The idea that some countries in the world are always going to be dependent because the countries that are their dominator, they don't want them to develop, right? Because as long as they stay poor, you know, we continue to manipulate them and, and, and dominate the relationship. There's even some people who will go so far as to say that rich people in poor countries deliberately conspire to keep the country poor because then they stay in power. You look at these dictators in some of these poorest countries in the world and they're wearing, you know, thousand dollar suits and they're in these huge limousines and they're living in these palatial palaces. Right. And, and they're like, you know, they keep getting elected three, four, five, six, seven, eight times in a row because the political system is rigged in their favor. If their country stays poor, they stay wealthy, right? If their country starts becoming more democratic, more equal, more educational opportunities, more jobs, more quality of life, they may not be able to stay in power as long, okay? So dependency theory, sometimes we talk about neocolonialism, where, yeah, the country's independent but they are still economically dependent on their old mother country. Now, again, a lot of criticism with this. Vietnam, right, fought hard against the French to drive the French out. And that's, if you go back and look at the history, that's how we got involved, right? Uh, you can look at places like uh, Mozambique driving uh, the Portuguese out. You know, there's lots of places in the world where you can look at neocolonialism and say, okay, there's examples, but then there's also the non-examples, right? So when you look at this chart, you see that a lot of the countries that are dependent, they're dependent because of commodity dependence, because they provide things like timber or iron ore or agricultural products like chocolate, vanilla, tea, coffee, um, or they provide rare earths and special metals and minerals. And therefore, the, the supplier is, is sending all of that stuff to the richer countries who, in exchange, are investing in the poor country, building infrastructure. Uh, they use their military to keep them in line, right? And this is what we see, is that these countries then, they fail to diversify because they get stuck in these relationships where all they're doing is giving, and then the rich country is all they're doing is the taking. Right. So we start to see that, for example, here with coffee producing countries. Right. They are in a uh, relationship where, you know, the United States, for example, we're four percent of the world, but we drink 50 percent of the coffee. 
right? These coffee producers are dependent on Americans to continue to buy and consume all of that coffee. All right. So global trade, it's a big thing. Uh, complementarity. If, if I have something that you want, you have something that I want. Complementarity. We're going to trade with each other. All right. Everybody wants to maximize their comparative advantages. We talked about transferability. You have to be able to ship the product, right? Either short distances or long distances. We talked about containerized shipping, intervening opportunity, right? I may buy the product from you, but what if I can suddenly find the product closer and cheaper? I'm not doing business with you anymore. I'm going to start going to this other place because it's better for me. It's a comparative advantage for me. OK, so read through this slide. We all want to understand how the basis of global trade works. Right. When you come back. All right. And there's a little bit of review there. Friction of distance, all that kind of stuff. All right. I'm going to run you through how the global economy of today is working. All right. Now, the world basically is now this big global economy. Right. This is kind of like that Wallerstein arrangement. And the countries that went through the Industrial Revolution a couple of hundred years ago are now deindustrializing. It doesn't mean they're going backwards. Remember, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quinary. The richest countries have gone past secondary, and now they're all tertiary, quaternary, quinary. Remember, 75% of the U.S. economy is services. The poorest countries are still kind of stuck in that agricultural industrial phase. Okay, Many times they're in the commodity supply phase, right? We know that container ships are the backbone of this global economy. We know that the newly industrializing countries like our Asian tigers, like our BRICS, right? Like our mints, right? Those kinds of countries, they're really emerging economies, emerging markets. And here's something else to remember. When you invest in big economies, they're not going to grow that much anymore. It's not that you can't make money buying U.S. stocks or European stocks or Japanese stocks. Yeah, you can still make money. But if you're a bit of a risk taker, where's the greatest reward potential? Don't buy the economy that's already big and mature. Buy into the economy where people have never been to Disney World, where people have never had a color television, where people have never had, you know, Air Jordan sneakers and those kinds of things. Those people, they're basically haven't had the flushable toilet yet. Think about, you know, um, women's hygiene products for many women in the poorest countries of the world something that we take for granted, right? So if you invest in those economies, they're close to zero. They've got nowhere to go but up, right? This is where you start to say, hmm, those globally significant investment opportunities. Because the global economy is changing very fast, right? The growth of the quaternary, quaternary jobs. We've outsourced and shifted all of the low skill jobs to the poorest countries. And now we have basically the design and the executive type jobs. They call this the international division of labor or the global division of labor. And it works like a commodity chain. It's like an assembly line, except the assembly line's not in one place. It's global. So you've got a designer in Cupertino, California, right? Uh, because you, you know this beautiful thing here, our little iPhone? Somebody in California says, wouldn't it be great? If we get a faster camera and we get more memory and, and we and we have Siri and we have all these great design initiatives, well, they don't necessarily make anything. They just design it. And then somebody's got to make the battery. Somebody's got to build the glass. Somebody's got to make the case. Somebody's got to design the software. Somebody's got to build the little chip. Somebody's got to process the chip and put all the data codes on it. That all happens now across multiple countries simultaneously. People in California, people in China, people in Germany, people in all over the world, and they create this commodity chain, this manufacturing chain with these forward and backward linkages. And it's the same in the steel industry. Where are you getting your coal from? Where are you getting your iron ore? Who's your customer? How are you going to ship the steel to them, right? Uh, it could be Nutella that we talked about in the agriculture chapter, right? All of these things. It could be a wine producer. Who's going to make your glass bottle? right? Where are you buying your fruit? Who's going to actually make the wine? Who's going to make sure that it, you know, we age it for 18 months and those kinds of things. Companies nowadays, they're all over the world with this. Apple is a big, huge player in this. Now we talk about foreign direct investment. 
Sometimes the companies are injecting money into an India, into a Brazil, into a South Africa, because they're saying, we'd love to take advantage of your cheap labor, but you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the facilities that we need. So sometimes the companies will pay for it because then they know that over time it will save them tremendous amounts of money. But sometimes it can get these countries into debt. And debt is a big thing. Now, we love to think that the United States has tremendous debt. Yes, we do. But our debt is still, when you think about the size of our GDP, right, our debt and our GDP are about the same. You have countries where GDP is, is significant lower and that debt level is just massively high and their GDP can't afford to get them out of the debt. And so they get hooked into these dependent relationships, right? We mentioned the BRICS, for example. Historically, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Um, the Tigers, they're now so developed. Uh, sometimes we don't even see South Korea thought of as being semi-peripheral anymore. Some people will just put South Korea in the core. And, and you could legitimately argue that. But now, again, you've got the Indonesias. You've got the, the Turkeys, right? Saudi Arabia because of their huge oil industry. Right? Obviously, Mexico, because of its proximity to the United States and the fact that the old NAFTA, the new United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, I mean, that's great for Mexico in terms of stimulating their economic growth. Right, So it's very important that you look at these newly emerging economies. These are examples of places where we're going to see a lot of economic growth. And of course, we're going to see a lot of foreign direct investment. We're going to see companies like German companies, UK companies, USA companies are going to, uh, and even Japanese companies are injecting money into, uh, you know, Mexico, Brazil, India, China, and those kinds of places, right? That foreign direct investment. I mentioned the new international division of labor. I'll give you a second to read this card. Um, it, it, again, it's, it's very similar to, I mentioned Apple with the iPhone. Um, you could talk about Walmart, which is sourcing products from all over the world. Walmart is now not just the biggest U.S. retailer. They're the biggest retailer in Mexico. They're the biggest retailer in India. Uh, they spent $16 billion buying a company called Flipkart, which is basically the Amazon of India. So, you know, think about it. India has 1.2 billion people, right? That's 1.2 billion potential customers, right? Most of whom have never used Amazon before. So if, in, if India represents that opportunity market, right, and, and Walmart's directly competing with Amazon right here in the United States in terms of Walmart.com, right? And now they have their own subscription service. So again, it's all about comparative advantage. It's all about, uh, you know, the comparability, the, um, the <laughs> comparative advantage, and also complementarity, transferability, and intervening opportunities, right? I'll finally get all that right. So make sure you have a chance to read through this card. Okay. So how does this look, this idea of this, you know, global economy? Um, value added, right? We take a raw material, right? And we say uh, the raw material is, you know, something that it, we're not going to pay a lot for raw materials. We're not going to pay a lot for the cheap labor. So look at the manufacturing itself. Notice that it's low value, low skill. The design of the product, the research, the development, the creation, the decision makers. Oh, look at that. That's high value, right? And then you go to the other side and you say the marketing, the sales, all of the distribution, the logistical people, right? All those decision makers are getting paid a lot. And all of those creative people are getting paid a lot. Who's not getting paid a lot? The people that are actually making it. Right. And so when you think about the stages in the commodity chain, remember, forward linkages always get you to the customer. Backwards linkages always get you to the supplier. OK. And in every product in the world, there are those commodity chain realities. Now, you think about the container ship that remember, we talked about the ship that's stuck in the canal. Where is that on this commodity chain? It's on the distribution part. OK. So somebody's already made the product. It's sitting in those containers. Somebody's already designed that product, but that product cannot get to the customer, which means that we can't sell it, right? And we can't make any money off of it. So any point in these commodity chains that there's a disruption, that's going to be a problem for the company, right? Uh, and so you see that this is how the global economy works. Now, 
countries are, again, comparative advantages. So they are sometimes trying to make their location better, right? World cities. There, remember, we talked about New York, London, Tokyo, centers of finance, centers of quaternary and quinary activity, tall skyscrapers, big executives, right? But yet Walmart, I mentioned biggest retailer in the world, their headquarters are in Bentonville, Arkansas. Remember, that's a great example of reverse hierarchical diffusion. They started very small and they've become very big, okay? Uh, in China, they have what they call export processing zones. China calls them special economic zones. Places in communist China where Western companies can come make money and they have profits and, and they can make billions and they can pay Chinese workers very little. The only exception is China gets to call the shots, right? This is why Google in China, you know, the searchability is not the same, okay? Uh, in Mexico, we talked about those maquiladoras earlier in the, shot, in the slideshow. What has this resulted in? In the richer countries, we have these zones of what we call rust belts. Right? These places that are in downward transition because they're abandoned, they're neglected, right? they're derelict. And we talked about that in the urban unit. And we said, for example, brownfields. Well, let me give you an example of what we were talking about. You take an old factory right, and you're like, Ugh. <laughs> oh, let's turn that into a microbrewery and let's charge people $17 for a hamburger. Right? And, and we'll have all kinds of you know, different uh, beers and craft drinks and all kinds of cocktails with exotic flavors and, and young urban professional people, right? the young sexy people that have moved into the gentrified neighborhoods where, hey, it used to be run down, but now, oh, and then after we go out to eat, let's go to the, uh, the, the, uh, the movie theater where we've got the leather couches and you know, it's all this fabulously modernistic view right? This is what's happening. A lot of brownfield redevelopment in American cities. So that Pacific Rim that I talked about, right? China, the tiger economies, the new ones, Indonesia, right? Thailand, Vietnam, all right? These are just absolutely amazing places for companies to now do business, right? Um, and it's not just the Asian side of the Pacific, right? There was a proposed idea for a Trans-Pacific Partnership. It never really got off the ground. It, it ultimately got killed in the U.S. government, um, in, in, the, in the Congress. But, you know, Chile is an emerging player, right? You look at Mexico as a big economy there. Um, but again, I can't stress enough, Vietnam, Indonesia. Um, obviously, you know, Singapore is one of the older ones. They've gone from being the cheap location to being the area of quaternary and quinary, like the U.S. and Japan. Singapore is now at that highest level of the economy. Okay, read up a bit about special economic zones. There's a big section in the David Palmer Blue Book about that as well. So oh, to show you what this looks like on a map, right, so that you can see the relative location. All right, Japan over there on the corner. Right, South Korea, one of your tigers, Taiwan, obviously, Hong Kong, which is at the Pearl River Delta, right, kind of down here. I'll use my little cursor here. Here's where Hong Kong is located. Shenzhen, that city in China right there. Uh, back when Hong Kong was British, Shenzhen had less than a million people. Since Hong Kong's independence, Shenzhen now has 20 million people. That's a huge place for factories because what has happened? This whole Guangdong province, which is where Guangzhou is, Guangzhou, similarly to Shenzhen, Guangzhou has just exploded. Uh, we took kids to China, right? Uh, we went to Beijing, we went to Shanghai, but we also went to Hong Kong. Uh, and we actually went to the edge of Hong Kong where you could look right over the fence into China. Today, that has kind of gone seamless because China has now taken possession of Hong Kong back from the British, right? And they're now... Uh, reconciling. They're bringing Hong Kong back into the Chinese system, right? So these are all great examples. The only thing you don't really see on this map is you don't see Singapore, which is way down on the tip of the Malay Peninsula, right? But for example, when we went to Shanghai, the picture at the top is Shanghai in the 1980s. Look at the far side. Look at the background, not the foreground. The foreground is European. It hasn't changed. Most of those buildings were built by Europeans in the 1800s. Look at the bottom image, right? That area there is called the Bund. 
right? And it kind of sounds German. There were English, there were German, there were Portuguese, there were all kinds of Europeans there. The biggest, most popular beer in China, even still today, is called Xingtao, right? Because the Germans made beer in China. And then when all the Europeans got kicked out, the Chinese kept making the beer, right? And then you look at that background part there where you've got that futuristic space needle. That's the, that's the Chinese state media tower. Uh, that big gigantic building kind of with a big hole in the top of it, right? That is the uh, World Financial Center in Shanghai. That building there that's the I Love Shanghai, that the side of the building is a skin that's like a, like an LCD, like a projector screen. So you can actually walk with your with your uh, you know your your earbuds in, and you can watch TV on the side of the building. It's incredible. Uh, we took kids into the top of this building right here. This is the Jin Mao Tower. When I went to China, this was the tallest building in China. Today, it's not even the tallest building in Shanghai. And this picture is old. This is not even the newest picture of what Shanghai looks like, right? And and it just shows you this explosive growth in the Pacific Rim. Right. Not just the tigers of South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and there's Singapore down there. But today it's not even China anymore. It's the Philippines. It's Indonesia. It's Thailand. And increasingly, it's Vietnam. Remember, we fought a war with Vietnam back in the 60s. Vietnam today is emerging as one of the hottest economies in that Asian uh, regional analysis. All right. For example, uh, we talk about the, the clothing industries, right? Bangladesh, right? India, Pakistan, all of South Asia, big in textiles right? and clothing industries, right? You can also see this in Southeast Asia. You can also see it in Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? Um, how is this working? A, a Fordist economy, everything was centralized in one place. In a post-Fordist economy, what we now see is that everything is, instead of being vertically integrated, it's more horizontally integrate, in, in, uh, uh, integrated. And what we're doing is we're flattening the production system. Instead of everything being made in only one place, there's multiple flexible production. And this is hopefully so that the supply chains don't get interrupted, like what we see with the canal, right? There should be more than one way. Uh, there's a guy named Parag Khanna. If you want to look him up online, he has a lot of great TED Talks. And uh, he's been talking this past week about why do we have 12% of the global trade going through one tiny little canal? Why don't we look for other opportunities, other investments? China is talking about a new Silk Road. Instead of putting things on a ship, they're building a railway across Eurasia to connect China to the EU. They call it the new Silk Road. It's incredible how this just-in-time delivery system is working. And free trade is a big part of this, right? Now, remember, a lot of countries in the world, they're shifting to services. Today, almost 50% of the global economy is a service-driven economy, not an agricultural economy, not even an industrial economy. It's a big service economy. Now, here's a great card, right? When you, when you think about the Fordist and the post-Fordist, Here's a fantastic summary of that, right? I'll give you a chance to look, but essentially, remember what I said, vertical integration is Fordist, right? The horizontal integration, a flatter management style over on the right-hand side with flexible production. Uh, Toyota, I'll give you another example. Remember, they, they were the big innovator of a lot of this. At Toyota, it's not just the CEO that makes decisions, the worker on the line. At Toyota, if a worker sees a problem, they can stop the entire system and they'll say, this shouldn't be like this. We could do it this way, save money, make it better. And, and Toyota encourages that in their employees. They want their employees to take ownership over the system. They don't want them to just be these mindless robots, right, that are going through it. Okay. Now, this means that there's also a multiplier effect. And we see this a lot with jobs. That when you create basic jobs, when you create a factory and you have 500 factory workers, well, what else is also going to happen? You need accountants for the factory. You need managers. You need secretaries. You need uh, custodians. You need truck drivers. You need the people who, um, you know, are the ancillary activities, the extra stuff. And then there has to be somewhere for the factory workers to go get their hair cut. They need to buy flowers for their partner for Valentine's Day. They want to go to the movies. They might like to go out to eat. 
They might need to get their car washed. They need a place to buy a car, right? Then they need a place to go get their car fixed and to buy tires. And, you know, that's the multiplier effect. Every job you create at that basic level creates non-basic employment. And this is why we talked about can politicians, you know, affect this? Yes, they can. If you create jobs, you're going to automatically have a multiplier effect to create more jobs, right? So one of those things is high tech. So we look at companies like the Fang companies. You guys know Fang, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Do you know that those four companies now are about 20% of the entire U.S. economy? Just those four companies, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. That's incredible. But there are certain places in the United States where these high-tech companies concentrate. We call them growth poles, or sometimes they call them technopoles. The best example is Silicon Valley in California, right? But also Boston, where you talk about the Texas Triangle, all right, North Carolina has a big technopole, uh, the area around Atlanta. And there is a common denominator there. It's some of the best colleges and universities, MIT in Boston, Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Texas Tech out there in the Texas Triangle. Obviously, Silicon Valley, you've got Caltech. You've got Stanford, uh, University of California, Berkeley. These are some of the best colleges and universities in the United States, and they're incredibly difficult to get into, okay? Remember, this is why as a freshman, you need to be thinking about do your best on every test, do your best on every assignment. You really have to be competing, not just anymore with American kids, but remember, we have a lot of Chinese, Indian African, Latin American, kids coming from all over the world to United States colleges and universities. You guys have to compete. You can't just be in the bed playing video games all right, every minute of the day from eighth grade to 12th grade. And, you know, think about, oh, you know, back in the day, you could be the C student in Indiana versus the genius in India. The genius in India wasn't going to get an opportunity. Today, you'd rather be the genius in India because the C student in Indiana is not getting into college anymore right? It's competitive, competitive, comparative advantages, right? Think about that. So when we think about all these high-tech places, these are quaternary and quinary type jobs, and they love to be near colleges and universities. Remember, the intern is the best employee of all, right? Especially if you don't have to pay them, right? So what are the factors that stimulate the technopole development? We talked about the highly educated workforce, right? Presence of research and development. These are people that are thinkers, right? They're designers, creative people. We need that venture capital. We need the investors. We need the people who say, I'll take a chance on your startup. I'll give you a couple of hundred thousand dollars, right? Think about Jeff Bezos. How did he become at one time the richest guy, now second richest, right? His parents gave him uh, a couple of ten thousands of dollars to get started, right? Bill Gates, right? Uh, you know, as a young teenager, a lot of these guys, they're, they're like Harvard dropouts. You look at the Mark Zuckerbergs at Facebook and, and you look at the, uh, the, the Microsoft people and you look at the Apple people like Steve Jobs and, you know, they started in the garage, you know, with their little startup industries. And it's incredible how they have now built an economy that is so dependent on fiber optics, on, on, on all of these electronic devices, right? And, and nowadays, just the FinTech, which is about to explode, you know, the Bitcoins and all of those kinds of things. Remember what I always tell you guys, the 10 biggest jobs of your life, they don't exist yet. Just like none of these things existed when I was in high school, right? We didn't have this stuff, right? So, one last thing to talk about here in that sense, and that's tourism. I mentioned that uh, FANG is a big part of it. Tourism is 10% of global GDP, right? Now, in fairness, in a COVID world, none of us have gone anywhere, right? We, we've been stuck for a long time. Uh, we didn't get to go to Iceland last year. We're not going to go to Iceland this year, right? It's already passed. Maybe we'll get to go to Iceland in the future. Uh, but most of this travel and tourism is from the core. Uh, and by the way, if you want to take a great ACE class and you're an ACE diploma seeking kid, take that ACE travel and tourism class, right? It's a really great class. Uh, but most of it is core to periphery or core to semi-periphery. Some of it, of course, is core to core. 
But usually there's no tourism from the periphery to the core because the periphery people, they don't have the time, they don't have the money, okay? Cruising is big, right? Big news just this week, Royal Caribbean talks about that they're going to resume cruising. Not from the U.S. because the U.S. government won't let them, but they have a deal with the Bahamas. And Royal Caribbean, a couple of decades ago, bought an island in the Bahamas, Coco Cay. It is their island. They own it. They don't need permission, right? It's their island. So now, as long as you can prove that you've got vaccinations, you can sail from the Bahamas. They'll take you to their own island. They'll let you play in the water for three or four days. And then you're going to go back to the Bahamas and then you can fly back home, right? So when we think about tourism, it's a big, big, big business, right? Disney's a big player, right? Obviously, the hotels, the restaurants, the casinos, all of these kinds of things. We know this. Because here in Florida, you know, about 23% of our state's sales tax economy is based, is basically paid for by tourism. Okay. Now, it's a special way we can look at this. Nowadays, they also talk about ecotourism. And I mentioned Costa Rica there, right? And you can certainly talk about, you know, zip lining in the jungle and stuff like that. But even places like the Maldives, right, where people just want to go in one of those bungalows that overlooks the water. You go to uh, Australia and you scuba dive on the Great Barrier Reef. And again, I've done that. That that It's just, it's phenomenal. We took kids to Australia and we took them out to the Great Barrier Reef. And, you know, you could snorkel and uh, a few of the kids, if they were old enough and if their parents signed a little waiver thing, they got to scuba dive on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you know, but again, it's all about preserving that environment. Now, speaking of cruising, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, Titanic in the front. And in the background there, that's one of the Royal Caribbean mega ships. You realize how big these things are, right? These are floating cities, right? We're talking five, 6,000 guests. We're talking 2,000 crew members, right? We're talking hundreds of thousands of tons. Uh, Titanic clocked in at about 50,000 tons. It takes like four or five Titanics to make the Odyssey of the Seas, the quantum class. And it's ironic because quantum is actually the smallest thing in particle physics, but yet they call it the quantum of the seas, right? It's supposedly this big, big thing. And these ships are just mega ships. They're huge, right? And again, we can go hiking in the jungle. Uh, you know, you can go into the rainforest of Malaysia. You can go to Machu Picchu in Peru. And, and you can go to Lake Titicaca and do all of those great things. And again, sometimes for me, this is fun to take kids on these kinds of trips rather than just, you know, the Louvre in Paris or the Eiffel Tower and all that. Yeah, that's great too. But sometimes kids just want to get into nature and do these kinds of fun things. All right. When we went to South Africa, we went out and did a game safari at Kruger National Park. And we saw, you know, the we were hunting for the big five, right? We wanted to see lions and we wanted to see elephants and we wanted to see rhinos and we wanted to see hippos and all that. It's just, it was a really, really cool experience, right? Now, this whole thing is about development. So let me end basically with this. Uh, the United Nations, a long time ago, 20, by 2015, uh, before the year 2000, they had established what they called the Millennium Development Goals. By the new millennium, they wanted to accomplish six or seven different things. I think it was seven. Um, now they've expanded the list to 17 sustainable development goals, and they've projected out to 2030 trying to eliminate poverty, end hunger, uh, achieve gender equality, provide universal basic education for everybody, uh, you know, a lot of environmental things, clean water, clean air, global partnerships for development, obviously attacking disease, all kinds of things. How are we doing? Now, you should remember that we did a quiz earlier this year where I had you use Hans's website, remember Gapminder, and, and now his son, Ola, and, and his wife, Anna, have taken over that whole program. Uh, the book Factfulness is a fantastic thing to read. If you maybe take that this summer and say, you know, when I go to the beach with my family, I'm going to take that book and I'm going to read it. Um, the reality is the world's way better off than you think it is. Uh, and sadly, the news doesn't usually tell us the good news. They only love to tell us the bad news about everything. Uh, the reality is, is that we're making tremendous progress towards these goals. Now, COVID is going to hurt, right? We're going to live in a pandemic world for a year and a half to two years or so, and we're going to have to recover from this. It's going to cost a lot of money. It already has. It's going to, it's devastating that people have gotten sick and people have died. 
But the reality is we are making tremendous improvement. And remember the biggest key, this education for girls. It has to be so fundamental because when girls have, ex have access to schooling and jobs and they have a better quality of life, we know that TFR falls. We know that they have better roles in the house. We know that they can get involved in government. We know that that stimulates economic development, right? We know Malala is very famous for that, right? So gender empowerment is one of those major goals. And we talked about a gender inequality index in this slideshow. Increasingly, environmental things are part of this here too. Clean water, clean air. Uh, they talk about life on land. They talk about life under the water. Uh, I gave you here a picture of the 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, if you want to check out the UN's website, if you just want to Google search SDGs, right, the sustainable development goals, you can find these things. Remember, inertia is a hard thing. The poverty that's going to be the most hard to eliminate is the most soul-crushing, multidimensional poverty. Not just economic poverty, but the poverty of lack of health care, the poverty of lack of education, the, the slum dweller poverty that we saw in Unit 6, right? Ending hunger. It, it, it's easy to end hunger for the people that are marginal. It, it, the hardest hunger to get rid of is the people who are destitutely poor, right? When we say quality education, right? Uh, again, COVID has really hurt that. A lot of kids are not in school, right? And it's not just in Boca. It's not just in the United States. It's not just in the Western Hemisphere. It's even worse in the poorest places of the world. We said that even in the best countries, gender equality is not yet achieved, but we're getting better, right? And then you look at all of those environmental ones, right? Whether it's clean water, whether it's climate action, right? When we talk about justice, right? And you like to talk about a lot of countries in the world, right? Myanmar is a great example where people of different races and different ethnicities don't necessarily have the same justice. And you know what? We don't always have to leave the United States to find the same problem, right? So these sustainable development goals are all targets that everybody can work towards to hopefully achieve, to create a better life and a better quality of life for people all around the world, right? Now, just to hit a highlight or two, pollution, we talk about plastic. Sometimes I go to a restaurant in Boca, I can't get a plastic straw. 95% of the plastic in the world comes from these 10 rivers. You'll notice that Boca Raton is nowhere on this map, right? So it's great that we're doing some of these things, but the reality is we need to be smart about the geography too, right? And, you know, this is where we need to focus a lot of those efforts, right? Uh, debt for nature swaps. Okay, well, I'm living here in South Florida and there's pollution and a plastic pollution in a river in Asia. How can I help? Well, when we donate money to these NGOs, remember we talked about non-governmental organizations? They sometimes do these debt for nature swaps where I donate to the charity. They will give the money to a country, right, on the other side of the world. And they'll say, we're going to pay off your debt, debt for nature swap. We're going to pay off your debt to European and Japanese and American banks and American companies, all that. You now take the money that you were spending on your debt and instead, we want you to clean up uh, the reef. We want you to clean up the, you know, the mountainside. We want you to clean up the jungle. We want you to clean up all of the problems environmentally that your country is facing. Remember, the richest countries are creating a lot of the environmental problems, but it's the poorest countries that are suffering the most. So these debt for nature swaps is like, okay, we'll take care of your debt. We've got money. We can't necessarily go clean up your country for you, but we'll pay for it then you have to take the money and you have to do it, which by the way, would create jobs, would create opportunities in those places. Now, I'll give you an example. This is Mexico City on a good day. This is Mexico City on a bad day. <laughs> look at the air quality. By the way, in case you're wondering, look at the lower left-hand corner of the picture. That is the exact same picture from the exact same camera on a different day of the week or the day, different day of the year. Sometimes they have great air quality, sometimes really bad air quality, depending on how the wind blows. Mexico City is kind of in a bowl and it's surrounded by tall mountains. But the Mexican government has taken steps to eliminate a lot of the car driving, to get people to use, you know, buses and light rail and things like that. But this is another example of a sustainable development goal. We have to make progress. China building the, the Three Gorges Dam. Hydroelectricity is a big part of this as well. And again, it creates jobs. It creates opportunities for manufacturing. It creates opportunities for development, all right? So 
two minutes and 13 th seconds, not necessarily my record, but we're getting close. Hopefully you can find ways to chunk this video and watch it. Most importantly, can I just tell you all, um, I've had a great time teaching you guys this year. Um, I'm excited about your opportunities for the AP exam. Please work hard towards that goal. As I've always told you, it's not my test score. It's not your mom's test score. It's your test score, right? It's my job to make sure you pass. It's your job to make sure you don't fail, right? I know you guys can do this. If you need help, please reach out to me. Send me a text on Remind. Send me an email. Let's talk in class. We've got a lot of time left before we take that exam, right? But we can't do nothing and then expect that, you know, something's just going to miraculously happen for us, right? So until then, be healthy. Help your parents. I'll see you in class.